what I will basically do now, uh, apologies for my, my voice that I partly lost. Uh, I would like to provide you an overview of what the World Weather Research Program is doing, as especially what are the main priorities, because this is important to set up the framework where the sub-seasonal to seasonal project is, uh, is, uh, is considered, and also because to provide you a view of how this strange machine is working, because, I mean, sometimes we have a, a kind of... Uh, quite a bureaucratic interpretation of what these big organizations are, are doing and while we should in some sense to be quite uh, uh, to be a little bit closer to what uh, the citizens and the med services and the, in general the services they are doing and providing at the country at the country level so i hope i will i will so it will be quite a little bit more general respect to what uh, Andrew was saying, but I would like just to provide you this uh, reference then to maybe have a, a di quick discussion. Okay, so the, the title is, it's not my title, is this interesting review appear in Nature uh, this year, is the Quiet Revolution of Numerical Weather Prediction. I invite you to, to try to find it, uh, to download uh, is from Peter Bauer, Alan Thorpe, and uh, Gilbert Brunet. And I think it's uh, an interesting review of, uh, of how the, the, the weather prediction community is working and probably in the near future and just now we are more and more, we are closer to the, to the climate community in this uh, seamless approach or try to, to work much uh, more together. Okay, so I think Let's start with this, some, let's say, maybe stupid question. So, uh, should I bring an umbrella tomorrow is probably is a question that is well answered or sufficiently answered today. Uh, although yesterday I was flying from, from Rome to here and the, the captain was saying, oh, probably there's the risk of fog, but fortunately the forecast will be wrong. So he, he, had, he had a completely different view of respect to, to my answer here, but that was funny. Uh, uh, you have to remember that aviation, aviation is the main driver for med services, especially in developing countries. And most of the revenue of the med service in developing countries are coming from aviation, so this is. But I think the problem is first to move to another set of questions. Uh, and this is, and this is a strongly related to what uh, Adrian showed before. So we are moving from weather forecast to impact weather forecast. So to try to provide much more information on the impact side, not just on the rainfall, which is just, uh, in pink, I mean, influencing the land surface, but really going down and providing information on what are the impacts. So one of the, the interesting questions was, I mean, the, at NOAA, the, in one of the last meetings, are, are we able to predict water quality, not just the rainfall, but the water quality in a complex urban network, for instance, in, a, in a developing countries, in a mega cities? So this is a challenge. So here, just to, to some, some key question that could be interesting. So how to plan next 10 days traffic in Shanghai when a tropical cyclone is approaching? Or what actions for a 24% landfall probability of a typhoon by a three-week prediction? So you have a, a prediction uh, which uh, provide you three weeks to be prepared, but the probability is quite low. So what is cost effective? Uh, or what health protocol should be run to be prepared for the next sand and dust storm, which is one other strong uh, uh, hazard which uh, is affecting a lot health uh, in terms of uh, not, to not only in Africa, but uh, in all the Middle East and in other in other countries in Asia as well. So I think more or less what we are, what the World Weather Research Program should do within the context of the World Meteorological Organization is to shape a little bit what is a MET future. So what is the future meteorological service? Because uh, uh, more and more we are competing and we are in a, in a, in a world which is it's changing quite quickly. So we have private sector coming. 
uh, we have other services appearing, but the, the main question remains. So what, what is really necessary uh, and how we can move or bridge to this uh, future? So uh, the World Meteorological Organization, especially for the World Weather, World Weather Research Program, is defined four challenges. So in the next 10 years, we will work around four challenges. First of all, the water, of course, the water availability, but the water forecast in many sense. In a city, for instance, the water quality or the risk of a flash flood. So water in, in, his, in the integrated water cycle, I would say, but certainly this is the first element. Then technology. Of course, technology matters a lot. Uh, in this quiet revolution of numerical weather prediction, you can imagine that the first element that matters is the, is the availability of com computational, uh, I mean, the availability of big computers, but it's not the only technological element. How to measure, uh, Adrian shown the mobility map, uh, based probably on mobile phone network. And Using mobile phone metro, actually, you can measure rainfall. Uh, you can inf infer more than measure, but you can infer rainfall maps. And this is a, a way technology uh, is important for our future, also because the cost and the, the maintenance cost of met many uh, observational networks is quite high. So there's a, another threat for the future. The other challenge is urbanization. In, uh, at, in 2050, we will, uh, I mean, 60, 70 percent of the population will work in cities. Will sorry, will live in cities. So this is is a is a big issue. So may, most of the services should be targeted to the urban areas. And of course, the third, the fourth uh, challenge is the uh, the high impact weather or extremes and how we should tackle this uh, extreme issue with a with a multidisciplinary prediction capability. And I think the example of the malaria is one, but uh, there are other examples in the health sector or in other sector like energy, for instance, uh, how to manage uh, a complex grid, uh, uh, electric grid in, in the future, where now in Paris they are discussing to increase the solar, uh, renewable energy, etc. So you, uh, you will have more and more a mixture of energy sources and which, of course, is quite complicated to, to manage. So let's stay with these four challenges. And uh, the main, of course, activity of the World Weather Research Program is, first of all, to increase the predictive scale. So this is just one example. Um, uh, what happened in the last, let's say, four or five decades? Uh, we gained. Uh, one day per decade. So, if you 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 if you consider yourself as a as a civil protection manager, I mean, f forty years ago, you would have able to use weather forecast, but just for the third or the fourth day, because the skill for the fifth or sixth day was not enough good for you. Let's make this example. So today. You can use the seventh and the and the off and the eighth day of the forecast. So we we are gaining one in terms of skill. We are gaining one day per decade, more or less, in the last 30, 40 years. Of course, this is is not a trend. We should we have some predictability limit, etc. But still, it's a, a, a tangible. Uh, I mean, success of the of the big weather research of the weather research community and the way we are providing services. So this is just an example of predictability. This is a, uh, a six-day forecast. Uh, so the contour lines are the 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 the, 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 um, the black line are the 500 hectopascal geopotential high. Uh, while the dash the dashed line is the uh, uh, is the um, analysis uh, of for the six day forecast corresponding to the six day forecast, and the difference you can see is the uh, actually is the is the error. So you can see that there's this kind of pattern, and especially a big error over Europe. But you can track, I mean, some sort of wave coming from the Pacific up to the 
cross, crossing the US and, uh, and arriving over Europe. And actually, uh, if you try to make some numerical exercise, uh, exercises, and you, you can actually deter determine that uh, the, the error source is here, especially over uh, up in the upper troposphere, where there's a big uh, uh, error in the measurements for the wind, for the upper level wind. So if you are increasing the, I mean, the observation here, you, you get this second forecast where you are dramatically reducing the, the error, actually. So just to, to explain, to, to simplify that one of, of the main tasks of the World Weather Research Program is try to improve uh, the, the, the predictive skill, and especially for several time scale, ranging from one day to one month. This is our objectives, of course, and S2S is one of, of the project. But there are several ways you, you would like to improve. The, you can try to improve this, uh, this forecast. So in the last 20 years, we developed several techniques in terms of data simulation capacity to increase the initial, the, uh, um, the, uh, to increase the number of observations that are used in the model. To, uh, to provide a forecast in terms of ensemble forecasting. So not just a deterministic forecast. This has been something, uh, I mean, coming from the last 20 years of, uh, of uh, research activities. So we are more and more working in terms of ensemble forecasting, which is actually is quite interesting because it's not only providing you uh, a better uh, capacity to detect, for instance, extremes, although with a, with a low probability maybe, but it is also actually better linking you with other decision-making and other uh, sectors because you are sharing the responsibilities. So if you are just providing a forecast for, let's say, the next five days, saying that in Trieste there will be just uh, 30, 20 millimeter per day in six days, actually you are providing a deterministic forecast. So anyone else will use this number. While if you are telling, you are providing a forecast in terms of probability, so what is the probability to exceed some threshold in, in, in 10 days? Actually, the, the, the people or the manager or other sector, they should interpret this probability, and they should use this probability. So in some, some way, you are sharing the responsibility, which is an interesting element in the last 10, 15 years of the weather, uh, of the weather forecast uh, 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 community and the, the way we are increasing the interaction with other sectors also. So of course you have Earth observation. I would remember that now we are using, we are receiving around seven millions of data per day from the satellite, but we are using just 20 percent of this data. And of course we, we are more and more improving the, the use of this data. Why, of course, because each kind, of, each sensor needs to be uh, uh, elaborated in order to trans translate this information into the initial condition for the moment model, which is not a direct, uh, uh, let's say, process, and it needs uh, it needs a lot of work in terms of data simulation. Of course, complexity. So we are moving towards a, a, a couple system for weather forecasting. I will provide you some example, especially for the for the polar prediction, but sub-seasonal to season is one example. We are, of course, using me, mo most um, most part of the models providing the monthly times monthly forecast to the sub-seasonal to seasonal database. They are coupled models. So also for this uh, weather forecast system, we are using weather, I mean, coupled system. Then, of course, we are moving to to another evolution, which is the resolution. Uh, now, I think the European Center is now, in January, is, uh, the, 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 uh, the resolution will be around uh, 12, uh, 15 kilometers. And uh, uh, at regional or national scales, in most part of the world, we have uh, one kilometer scale forecast prediction. And we are moving, especially for special, uh, for the aviation, down to 500 meters or something. So this is really a, a, an area where the, 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 the step forward, uh, and we, there's been a really increasing 
work in the, in the last 10, 10 years. Okay, the other element is, of course, bridging with technology. I already mentioned this, uh, uh, this element, which is the, the mobile phone network providing you, because, of course, you have power. Uh, depending on the rainfall rate, the, the, the system uh, is the network, the mobile network is setting different power for tr transmitting power. So you can infer the, the rainfall rate uh, based on this uh, information, except if the mobile... Uh, a phone company will provide you with the data because there are tricky, I mean, elements behind if, because there are some uh, threshold defined by law and uh, in some cases they are actually not, they are going, uh, they are, they are, uh, ex they are, um, they, they, it's not expected that they, they should uh, go up and to, to over, overcome this threshold. So this is one one issue. And of course, technology means also computing power. This is just a funny example, but this is the first uh, ENIAC uh, computer used for the first weather forecast, uh, 5th uh, January of 1949. It's funny. The first, the first 20, do you know how, how long it, it took to make a 24 hour forecast? That's funny because it's, it's called the first forecast. It, it took 24 hours. So <laughs> it's, uh, it's uh, uh, and this was 30 tons, and your eye watch could be order of 30 grams or something. So it's interesting measuring the technological gap in terms of uh, of weight. From uh, yeah, and but this is more or less the, the same power of the same computational power uh, we ha we had with the, with the ENIAC at the beginning uh, after the Second World War. So there's a strong, and now there's a, there's a bottleneck, of course, because uh, while 10 years ago the big uh, companies producing uh, cheap uh, producing computers, they were first referring to weather climate sector. Now they are referring to your, uh, maybe your young, younger brothers uh, playing with the PlayStation. So they are investing much more on games than on other uh, sectors, and so the, the, the the different structure of the chip of the technology, of course, affects how we can use our codes and our models. And this is, of course, needs a, a lot of, uh, I mean, there's a lot of work behind, I think, ECNWF is, is working a lot in this, in this, along this direction. And of course, it's more and more a multidisciplinary prediction. So uh, we are less and less stopping to uh, just focusing on, on rainfall, and more and more focusing on the impact-based variables, parameters to be provided to, 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 in terms of services. So this is one of the, uh, has been probably quite, uh, it's been discussed quite, uh, quite a while during this, this week. So of course, uh, I would like just to, to show you what is the structure of the, how, how a world a research program is structured to, to tackle these issues and to try to organize the work. Uh, it's, I think it could be interesting to know how this, this machine is working. Of course, I've, I've told you that we have these four challenges, the water cycle, urbanization, emerging technology, and extremes. And we have core projects which are the sub-seasonal to seasonal, the polar prediction, and the high impact weather. Usually this, those projects are 10 years long. The previous one was Torpex, which was uh, focusing, uh, I mean, to improve predictability. And now we have these three projects, more or less 10, 10 year long, and they are our core projects. So, and sub-seasonal to seasonal is one of them. It's not, they are not the only project we have. So we have also another bunch of projects uh, which, of course, we are not defining as core project, but we have a several demonstration projects. One is on aviation, for instance, which is quite important, and several on tropical cyclones. Uh, demonstration means that they are trying to bridge uh, between the research and the, operational, uh, and the operational services. And, of course, we have pre-operational project, and one is sand and dust storm project, which is uh, providing uh, real-time uh, weather uh, sand and dust uh, forecast, which is quite important element for the health sector as well. 
And we have several working groups, uh, experts working with us and try to provide guidelines and try to provide uh, uh, a framework to improve the predictability, to improve the uh, multidisciplinary approach, etc. And this is the list of the of the working groups, the the numerical experimentation, which is which is known as WIGNI. I'm trying to to have a kind of uh, free acronyms uh, presentation, uh, uh, which is the opposite of what happen of what usually happens in in WMO, where you have. Uh, I mean, the first two months in WMO, I spent my time just to, to try to understand acronyms. That was a funny, funny period. Um, uh, that is a good, good question. <laughs> so we have now casting a mesoscale working group, of course, working on the short time, short time scale. We have tropical meteorology, which is really important because, of course, WMO is a United Nations organization as, as ICTP under UNESCO, so uh, the first uh, question is, I mean, the first uh, important question is how to, to help or to support uh, who, who needs who need most. And of course, tropical areas, you have most of the developing countries. And predictability and dynamic and ensemble forecasting is trying to better understand the predictability issues. Data simulation and observing system, which is really critical because it's uh, one of the elements that is uh, actually linking our activities also with the climate community. Verification working group, that is another important, uh, uh, an important uh, uh, working group. Social and economic application and weather modifications. Okay, just uh, I think I can try to go quickly up, along the three main, the three core projects. So the subseasonal to seasonal, you, I think you know everything. Uh, but I would like just to, to remember you what, behind there, there's certainly the fact that on this monthly time scale, most of the decision, uh, or most of the decision makers, they are really interested to this time scale because um, in terms of energy, agriculture, uh, health sector, several decisions uh, are based on this information, if available, of course. And just an example, the this year drought uh, in, in, uh, in California, which is continuing actually, uh, and, and affected uh, both the agriculture sector and the energy sector. And uh, this is one key example, and I think uh, uh, one of the ideas Andrew mentioned to, to really reinforce uh, the activity of the sub-seasonal to seasonal project is to find partnership with other sectors to try to provide these exemplars, to, to provide potential, uh, I mean, example. And the one uh, uh, Adrian shown today about uh, Uganda and about that, the health sector could be an interesting example to, to, to be explored. And I think we have good connection with WHO and we have other UN agencies working on the migration, so that uh, could be an interesting area. But this is one of our projects. The second one is the polar prediction. Uh, you know, there's a strong interest uh, uh, along the polar area, especially the Arctic in the, in the last, why? Uh, because, of course, in many cases, the driver is not a climate driver, but is a, an economic driver as well. So we, we should be aware. I mean, we are living in this world, this complex world. Uh, so one of the questions is uh, uh, if the, the decaying uh, ice cover in the last 15 years will allow shipping routes uh, across the Arctic. Of course, most of the Asian countries uh, will prefer to go through the Arctic uh, shipping route. So there's a strong interest from China, South Korea, uh, Singapore, and other other countries there. But and of course there is a strong interest from the countries uh, sitting in into the Arctic, so Russia, e e Canada, etc. So. Uh, of course, there's a, a strong interest in terms of science. Why? Because the coverage, uh, both in, for the Arctic and the Antarctica, uh, in terms of, uh, of uh, the observing system, is quite low. So 
we actually we are not observing the ne the observational network is not up to date respect to what we we need and this is important not only for the weather community for the climate community as well because uh, do you know you have uh, several processes running at very small scale so one of the last uh, uh, I mean uh, finding in terms of uh, climate research for the Arctic is you have this uh, uh, in the in the ice sheet you have the formation of these uh, small holes around the, the Arctic. And actually, the amount of uh, uh, shortwave radiation which is penetrating down into the ocean is that never, never been measured up to the last uh, two years. And now you, you discover that, that the, the shortwave uh, amount of energy that is penetrating down in the ocean is really higher than you, you expected. And this is, of course, will could accelerate the the melting phase or in the in the next ten years. But this is really related to the capacity to observe, observe uh, the the surface, but observe also the the um, what is happening uh, uh, beneath the the, the ice uh, the ice cover. So there is a gap in terms of observation. Uh, we're starting to have a couple system, or at least we have a couple system in terms of uh, ocean and ice models. This is a Canadian uh, uh, operational system. So it's, uh, it's uh, running uh, and providing uh, uh, 10 to 20 to 30 days of, uh, of uh, um, forecast for the, for the area. This is just the sea surface temperature, if I remember well. But it's a coupled system, so it's providing information on the ice extent. And uh, in terms of verification, it's interesting because uh, what, what has been done here is to ask the, the shipping routing industry what would have been the best uh, uh, measure of, to verify uh, the, the extent of the ice sheet. And of course, the the answer was quite simple. So the best way is to measure the distance bet between the coast and the ice, and this has been, I mean, set up as the new a new parameter to be to be verified by Environmental Canada, which is the uh, Met Services in Canada. Just to explain you how the verification also is related to the users, not just to what you believe to be the most important parameter for your dynamical system. So this is another interesting question. And there's potential skill, yes. This is the persistence based uh, in terms of uh, root mean square error. Um, and this is basically a forecast for the ice extent that is based on persistence. And this is just based on the system I've shown you before. And the root mean square error is much lower for a specific season in, in using the, the coupled system, ocean and, uh, and sea ice. But why should we invest a lot of money to have networks there where few guys are living there? So, what? so this is, uh, I don't know how many from you are, are from, from the Nordic regions, but probably no one here is coming from, from the Arctic or the Antarctica. Uh, but the, the answer could, yes? Ah, yeah. This is for a specific uh, season, I would say. Is uh, yeah. But this is a weekly forecast, so I think it's uh, is uh, for a specific uh, period. So it's not for average uh, over all the all the all the year. So I think it's uh, you are you are filtering out your your seasonal. Well, I'm on, I'm seasonal scale is usually uh, the systems the anomalies that the uh, Oops, sorry. Uh, so here you have an experiment done. Uh, 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 for a 30-day forecast, which is the, the subseasonal time scale we are looking here, 
And uh, this is the difference, in the, is, a, is a kind of indicator of potential predictability, uh, which is quite interesting because it's, uh, if you run your prediction system uh, without any, I mean, uh, the state-of-the-art prediction system, and then you run the same system just, uh, uh, of course, this is an Einkast experiment. So if you run for the past and you, um, and you relax, your, your system to the analysis over this uh, part of the Arctic. What you get, of course, you get a, 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 a trivial answer that you are in increasing the predictability where you are relaxing your system. That's fine, okay. But what is interesting that you are increasing predictability far away. And this is a little bit sometimes uh, uh, we should explain in terms of uh, of the link with the, with, with the jet or with the, the, the shape or the phase of the planetary waves. But certainly it's interesting that for day 610 and on for day 11 to 30, you have some signature of potential predictability. Of course, the, 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 the indicator is not so high, but it's interesting to say that if you are increasing the number of observation of the Arctic, this is just to simplify these results, actually you are getting uh, uh, some uh, positive uh, results uh, far away from, from the Arctic. Uh, this is just to show you the, the, the working group working on the polar prediction. And this is the most important thing is we, this field campaign, the year of polar prediction, that will be uh, between 2017 and 2019, but centered on 2018. This will be a quite a big effort concerning also Arctic and Antarctica. And this is one of the, one of the, I mean, of the challenge of the next two, three years for the polar prediction. Uh, let's, few words on the third uh, project, which is uh, related in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of challenges uh, to the subseasonal to seasonal, although the time scale is, uh, is shorter, is the high-impact weather project who is co-leaded by Brian Golding, Met, Met Office, and David Johnston from, from New Zealand. And this uh, uh, project, of course, is mainly focusing on, on cities or urban regions, let's say. Uh, here is an example of uh, uh, risk associated to natural hazards uh, for cities. And you can see that this is quite democratic, it's covering uh, uh, it's not just for, it's for developing and developed countries. So there's, uh, in terms of uh, thread, it's, uh, it's of course covering uh, all, all the world. So of course cities uh, matter. And this is, the, uh, this is another indicator which is quite important. It's coming from WHO, is outdoor air pollution, is the risk associated to air pollution. Because this project is trying to bridge between the classical uh, meteorological information and uh, other impact-based uh, information, and one is, uh, is for air quality as well. So these are the main element of the, uh, the main topic of the project, the main topics, so urban flood, disruptive winter weather, wildfire, urban heat waves and air pollution, and extreme local wind. So the project will try to cover all these uh, activities, but the way is doing is is uh, the way is is run is uh, is focusing on not only on the geophysical side of the how to improve our forecast how to provide better information for this specific sector but how this information is actually used in the decision making chain so how the weather information the weather forecast it transformed or translated into weather information. So this project is a multidisciplinary, so, so, so sociologists are part of the project, and we are trying to understand for these specific sectors and area how this information is used, and actually how this information can be better used. I told you at the beginning of the talk about this sharing responsibility. When the first time UK Met Office moved from deterministic forecast to ensemble forecasting. The civil protection, the UK civil protection was quite upset because of course receiving a millimeter per day was just saying, okay, I can issue an early warning because the UK Met Office said that uh, uh, there will be 100 millimeter 
per day in, in three days. Okay, it's fine. While if I have to interpret this data, I have to share the responsibility. So I have to take a decision based on my interpretation. And of course, uh, this is, is changing a little bit. So here we are trying to better understand this process and to try to see, and this is just a decision making, I mean, how for a specific uh, hazard, which is uh, uh, related to flash flood, and especially for river management and coastal floods, what are all the uh, steps in terms of decision making and in terms of actions based on the, on the lead time as well. So just to explain you what, what was the, and of course at the end there is the decision uh, take by individuals. This is uh, quite. So I think that I will stop here. I will just, uh, ah, just to let you know something. What, of course, this is a funny title, but what successful people read before bed. So this is, um, uh, you can uh, Google seamless prediction WMO and you will uh, win this book. You can download, it's a PDF. Uh, this book, it, it comes out from the World Weather Open Science Conference last year in Montreal. And this is kind of a summary of the main challenges, and there are several chapters dedicated to, to how to improve weather prediction, uh, observation, data simulation. I think it's, it's an interesting book and uh, is free of charge. Of course, you cannot resell, but it's free of charge. So you can download. And uh, it's a WMO publication, but I think that more than 100 scientists around the world, uh, they worked to produce in terms of authors and uh, reviewers to produce this book. So it's really uh, a community book and that's, uh, it's a, an important step forward, I would say. And I would like to, sh I don't know if the sound is working. In the, if I run a short movie, uh, I don't know, Adrian, if the, Because I would like to show you, it's one minute movie, so it's really sh short. Uh, because uh, then I would like to ask you at the end of the movie if, uh, if you can summarize in one, two keywords what, what, you, what is your first feeling, uh, what has come out from, from based on the video on your, on your mind. Because this video, is, it will be used in the new WMO website as a, as a kind of... Uh, of a presentation of World Weather Research Program activities. So let's see if the... feedback because uh, I think it's uh, it's well, useful. I'm a movie maker. Yeah. I'm a movie director. I'm an actor. I sing and I'm a scientist. This is powerful. <laughs> okay. I said you like to see a full film. Yeah, yeah. Who's going to play the lead? <laughs> Well, thank you, Paolo. I think you've opened it up nicely for discussion. So comments, please. 